coming is closer than I think any of us can imagine. You say, preacher, I've heard you say that. No telling how many times. And it's getting closer. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to tell you something. The Bible says in the twinkling of an eye it's going to happen. If you ain't ready, you ain't going to have time to get ready. So you better be ready now. Open your Bibles, if you will, Isaiah chapter 43. Isaiah chapter 43. I hope this morning you come praying. I hope this morning you come expecting a blessing. I hope this morning you've come lifting me up. Praying that God's will would be done here today. Simple message. You may not get anything that you've never got before, but that's all right. I'm thankful we can go back. Let me say this before I read this passage of Scripture. I am not now, nor have I ever been, and I hope God will let me keep my good mind, I am not what some people would call a replacement theologian. I almost couldn't pronounce that word. The church has never taken the place of Israel. Right. Right. And the church never will. Right. Okay. The Old Testament tells us very plainly that Israel is God's wife. God's chosen people. But you and I who are saved are the bride of Christ. Right. Okay? God has made promises to Israel. God has made promises to the church. Yeah. Israel's going to get the new earth. Thank God I'm going to get that new city Jesus is going to prepare. Mm -hmm. However, there are some things that do apply to both. Not that one's going to take the place of the other, but there are some that applies to both. That being said, Isaiah chapter 43, start in verse number 1, the Bible says, But now, thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name, thou art mine. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee, and through the rivers that shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. I gave Egypt for thy ransom, Ethiopia, and Sheba for thee. Since thou wast precious in my sight, thou hast been honorable, and I have loved thee. Therefore will I give men for thee and people for their life. Fear not, for I am with thee. I will bring thy seed from the east and gather thee from the west. I will... Say to the north, give up. And to the south, keep not back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Even everyone that is called by my name. For I have created him for my glory. I have formed him. Yea, I have made him. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, as we come to you again this morning, we thank you for the day. Thank you for taking care of us and watching over us. Thank you for every need being supplied. We thank you for the health and strength you give us. We thank you for safe keeping from harm and danger. God, we know that every good thing we have is from you. And you've been mighty good. We thank you this morning, Father, for the privilege we have to be back in your house. We thank you for each one of these that's come out. I truly thank you for every home and family represented. Thank you we've got this time that we can come. We can worship together in spirit and truth. I thank you, Father, most of all for salvation. I thank you for Jesus. I thank you for the blood that was shed at Calvary. Thankful this morning that he did it all and he left nothing out, left nothing undone. I beg you, God, forgive me where I failed you. Forgive me why I've let you down for the things said, done, and thought. I pray you'd remove them, take them away, get them under the blood. But Father, I want to thank you for the service already, the time in Sunday school, the time in prayer room, the songs that were sung. But God, I need your help now. Father, it's preaching time, and I can't do this without you. 
I need that fresh touch this morning and that fresh anointing. I need you, God, to have me behind the cross and let people realize it's not about me, but it's about Jesus. I ask you, God, to give me the words that you have said. Show me what you'd have me to do. And I pray, God, that you'll watch my mouth. Don't let me say it wrong and don't let me lead anybody astray. Or only let me do that which you'd have me to. I pray, Father, more than anything, that if there's anybody under the sound of my voice that does not know Jesus and Savior, that today would be the day that they'd step out on faith Make their way to an old-fashioned altar and ask Jesus Christ to come into their heart and life. Repent of their sin and be born into the family of God. You have your way in this service and for what you do, we'll thank you, we'll praise you. We'll give you the honor and the glory for we ask it in Jesus' sweet, holy, righteous name. Amen. The nation of Israel has been through a lot. They've let God down. They've sinned against Him. They have been punished. But God is telling them, I'm going to redeem you. I remember in Sunday school class about the third judge we got to. The Bible tells us that then the people began to walk away from God and they were brought... And when we read that about the third time, Daniel looked up and he said, again? And I said, yep. They do it over and over. Just like we do. We fail him. We let him down. But I'm thankful today that I've got a Redeemer. I've got one that loved me. I've got one that went to the cross. I've got one that shed his blood. I've got one that did for me what I couldn't do for myself. He became poor so that I could be rich. He died so that I could live. He did it all. Let's just jump right in. Look at verse number one. Well, when you get look at verses two through four, he begins to talk about how I'm not going to leave you and I'm going to be with you. And I'm thankful for that today. I'm thankful I've got a God that's always there. And I'm not mentioning this Wednesday night. And I may even be mentioning it again this afternoon that the book of Hebrews tells us in 13.5 that he said he'll never leave us, he'll never forsake us. Jesus told us in Matthew 28 20, He said, I'm with you always. Always, even to the end of the world. I'm thankful that even when we leave this world, He still ain't going to leave us because He said, David said in Psalm 23, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for thou art with me. I'm serving a God that's always going to be and always going to be with us. Always going to be present. I like that very present help in time of trouble. But he tells us in verse number one what's got to take place first. He says, But now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name, thou art mine. He said, I have redeemed thee. God said, I've paid the price. There's a price that you couldn't pay yourself. And he said, So I paid it for you. Paid it for you. If you look at that word redeem, it all it goes back to even to that to the book of the roof. It, it refers to that kinsman redeemer. And that kinsman redeemer would buy back what had been lost. We look at Boaz in the book of Ruth as that kinsman redeemer. He had he bought back everything that, that Elimelech had lost, and Nalon and Chilion should have gone to them, but they died all, all died over in the land of Moab. So Boaz was willing to pay the price and do what needed to be done. Beautiful picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. But thank God I've got a God this morning that done better than Boaz could ever think about doing. Thank God he said, Fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name. Thou art mine. When he redeems us, he has paid that price. He has done what we could not do for ourselves. And we need to understand that today. And when he has bought us, when he has Say us, we are His and we're not to be anybody else's. Paul told the church in Galatia, he said, you know, he said, how, how did you get so far removed from the one that you put your faith in? How did you get to the point where you think that you've got to finish in your works what was started in the Spirit? Did I look back, and I'm not trying to be ugly, but I look back at one of the darkest times in our nation's history. 
There was a time when slavery was a reality. It was prevalent. And those slaves had no choice where they were going to live, what they were going to do, how they were going to spend their day. They had none at all. Can I tell you something? And I'm not referring to God as a slave driver, but 1 Corinthians chapter 6 still tells us that ye are not your own for you're bought with a price. That's right. He has redeemed me. He's paid for me. I don't have the right to go off on my own. We even looked this morning and finished up that book of, uh, of Judges. And that last verse in the book of Judges said that every man, there was no king in Israel, and every man did that which was right in his own eyes. And when we begin to do what's right in our eyes instead of what's right in his eyes, when we begin to do what's right in our feelings instead of what his word says, then we go back to Proverbs chapter 14 when the Bible says, There is a way that seems right unto a man, but the ends thereof are the ways of death. Yeah. I am bought with a price. I'm not my own. He owns me lock, stock, and barrel. I don't have the right to go off on my own. My job, my responsibility, my duty, my obligation, but we shouldn't even look at those words. We ought to be able to say my opportunity and my privilege is to do the things that God Almighty wants me to do. Yeah. It's like coming to the house of God. It's just like telling people about Jesus. You know what, folks? That That's... If we get to the point that other things are taking those priorities away, there's a problem somewhere. Yep. But he tells us, he says, Fear not, for I have redeemed thee. He paid that price. There was a point that Jesus, you know, some of them thought, well, you know, he's just here for everybody to serve, and he's just here to get his to get what's good for him. He's just here to have himself a good time. He's just here. And I understand today, I've met pastors in my life that would send out resumes to look for the best offer they could get from the church. That ain't right. Now you say what you want to say. I've had people ask me, are you going to send us a resume? No, I ain't going to send you a resume. If God leads you to call me to come and, and you want to hear it, that's fine. But no, this is not something where you, you send out resumes and, and say, well, you know, this church can give me this or this church can give me that. And appreciate what the church does for us. But no, sir. No, sir. They ain't nobody called to preach of God got any business going out and doing whatever they want to do. And that's why Jesus said in Mark chapter 10, the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister. He didn't come. Listen to me now. I'm not, I'm not backtracking. I am saved by His grace. I am cleansed by His blood. I am a part of His family. My name's in the Lamb's book of life. He's preparing me a place to go when I die. My place is to serve Him, and I'll get on into that. But when He came the first time, He came to die. Right. To die. Right. Do you understand that? He said, For the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and to give His life a ransom for many. And He redeemed us with that blood. And when He paid that ransom, that ransom literally means to loosen or to set free. And if you're saved by the grace of God today, you're no longer in under the bondage of sin. The devil shouldn't have you. You ought to be free because whom the Son makes free is free indeed. He came today. Yes, I'm not my own. I've been bought with a price. But He has set me free. And because... We've been set free by the blood of Christ. I've been set free by what Jesus did at Calvary and at that empty tomb. Thank God this morning, I don't do what I do because I have to. I do what I do because I like doing it for Him. Amen. That's the way we're supposed to live our life. Right. Gave His life a ransom. That's what He came to do. Oh yes, sir. There's going to come a time that every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess. There's going to come a time that he's going to sit on the throne of David in Jerusalem. He's going to rule this world with a rod of iron. But, when he came that first time, he came not to be served, but to serve. He came not to be ministered to, but to minister. He came to give his life. He came to die. He came to shed that blood. And there was no secret what, what he was coming for. It didn't just spring it on him in the garden of Gethsemane that night. That's why when John the Baptist looked at him there in John chapter 1, he said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He knew. John the Baptist even knew he was going to die. So he said he came 
to pay that price. He came to redeem us. He did redeem us. He bought us. He purchased us. And He gave His life a ransom. He redeemed us so that we could be set free. And now in Revelation chapter 5, after the church gets home, after the judgment seat of Christ, after we cast those crowns at His feet, the Bible tells us that we're going to sing a song and we're going to say that Thou was slain and has redeemed us to God. How? By Thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nations. Not only, Father, did He come and He redeemed us, not only did He ransomed us, He told us what He ransomed us with. It is the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, that cleanses us from all sin. And there's no other hope. You say, well, preacher, I, I, I'm going to get to heaven like this. Or I'm going to get to heaven like this. Or I'm going to get to know you ain't. You bypass the cross. You bypass the blood. You bypass the empty tomb. You will die and go to hell. Right. Now it don't get much plainer than that. But he said thou hast redeemed us by thy blood. And what does he say? Out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. So going from there, let's jump out to verse number 5 for a minute. Fear not, I am with thee. I will bring thy seed from the east, gather thee from the west. I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, keep not back. Bring my sons from far and my daughters from the ends of the earth. And I know in that passage of Scripture, if we keep it in context, he is talking about the ingathering of the nation of Israel back home where they're at right now. Yeah. That happened. Hey, look. When that flag was raised in 1948, people should have woke up right then. Mm -hmm. People should have realized God's clock had started ticking. People yep. should have realized that the time was coming. That it was just, I mean, just a matter of time. You said, preacher, 1948, that's been over 70 years. I, I don't care how long it's been. The clock started. You better be ready to go. Yeah. But what did he tell them? He told him the same thing that he told us. Now, understand something today. We look at different people. We look at we look at white skin, brown skin, black skin, yellow skin, all of this, and we look at different races. Can I tell you something right now? God only saw two. And that right. was the Jew and the Gentile. Yep. That was the only two races in God's eyes that there are. Right. Now understand what I'm saying. Just hear me out. The only two races. And you know what Paul said? Thank God. In Galatians chapter 3, I like verse 28 and I like verse 29. In verse 28, he says, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Right. He told them there in verse 5 verse 6, he said, I'm going to bring you from the east, the west, the south, and I'm going to bring you from the north. He's telling us here, it doesn't matter who you are, what you are, what you do, or anything else, Thank God we're all one in Christ Jesus. And then when you get down to verse 29, and I won't quote this right, it tells us that because of the blood of Christ, the blessings of Abraham are mine. And you say, what blessings? What did he promise Abraham? Abraham, what for... Read Hebrews chapter 11. Abraham, what for a city whose builder and maker is God? A city that had foundations. Yeah. Thank God there's too much in this world that's a shifting sand right now. Right. I don't yeah, have to yeah. worry about that. One of these things yeah. I'm going to leave here. And I'm going to go to a place that's set and solid on 12 Amen. foundations. Right. Thank God those walls of Jasper. Those gates of pearl we talked about the other night. That place is real. Yeah. That place is where I'm going. And the only reason I'm going is because He has redeemed me by His blood and brought me out of the nation. Amen. So He talks about it in Romans chapter 3. He talks about it. The difference between the Jew and the Gentile. Hear me out. He says, what then? Are we better than them? He's talking about the Jews. He talked about the Jews earlier on how God had blessed them. It was God that, that had given them the Word. And you read your Bible. If you got the right kind of Bible, there's 66 books in it. And all 66 of them was written by a Jew. Right. Not a Gentile in the crowd. Right. Every one of them were written by the Jews. Under the Jews were given the oracles of God. It was for the Jewish people that, thank God, the Messiah came. It was a Jew, listen to me, a Jew from the tribe of Judah that went to that cross to die for your 
your sins and mine. That's right. The tribe of Judah of the flesh. So don't ever not look down your nose at them. Don't ever make fun of them. We've covered that in the last couple of weeks. The Bible still says, and I'll tell you again in case you wasn't here. The Bible says very plainly, God made Abraham a promise. Said, he that curses you, I'll curse, but he that blesses you, I'll bless. Right. Yeah. That still holds true today because God don't change and his word's forever settled in heaven. Right. Mark her down. So what does he tell us? In Romans chapter 3, he said, so are we better than they? No. No. Paul's not saying, look, you do. Now remember, remember, when Jesus in John chapter 4 went to Samaria, Told that woman, said, give me a drink. She said, why are you a Jew asking me a Samaritan for something to drink? They didn't mix. They didn't have anything to do with each other. The Jews looked down their nose at the Samaritans because the Samaritans were mixed. They, they weren't all pure Jews. They had mixed with the other crowds when they'd gone into the Assyrian captivity. He showed us right then. Let me tell you something, folks. They ain't none of us no better than nobody else. Amen, that's right. And you better mark her down. And you can sit here and say, well, preacher, I don't know so well about that. Look, my circumstances might be better. My destination is better than somebody that's lost. But let me tell you something. I'm no more worthy to be saved than a drunk in the gutter in this morning. You ain't either. You not either. So he asked the question about the Jew. He says, are we better than they know in no wise? For we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. We're all under sin. So in God's, in God's eyes, in God's authority, in God's judgment, when He looks down on this earth, He doesn't care who you are. He doesn't care where you live. He doesn't care what your name is. He doesn't care what you do for a living. He doesn't care how much money you've got. He doesn't care what kind of car you drive or what kind of house you've got. I'm going to tell you something right now. There's none of us righteous in our own because Isaiah is going to say later on in the, in the book that all of our righteousnesses are as filthy right. Mm -hmm. None of us. You say, well, preacher, you just don't know me. Now, I don't need to know you. God does. If God says uh, you're a right. sinner in need of a Savior, just yep. like I was. Amen. Now it's that plain. As it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. There is none of us deserving to go to heaven. There is none of us deserving to enjoy peace throughout eternity. Every one of us in here, sometime a couple of years ago, tried to bring a message on the difference between justice and justification. I don't want justice, thank God. I am justified by Christ. Amen. And that's what's going to get me to heaven. Yep. I don't want what I deserve. I don't want what the judgment of God demands. Because thank God I've got the blood and therefore because I've got the blood I'm going to be justified through Christ. Amen. So God does not care who you are, where you're from, or what you think you've got or who you think you are because there is none righteous, no not one. And what does he say up here in verse 5 and 6? I'll bring thy seed from the east, gather thee from the west, I'll say to the north, give up to the south, Keep not back. Bring my sons from far and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Jesus was talking talking to some Pharisees one day in Luke chapter 13. And he's telling them, y'all think y'all are the only ones that's got it? You know what the joke used to be? The joke used to be that when, when people get to heaven that God's going to take them down one corner of heaven and say, shh, shh, shh. Y'all be still because this section's for the Baptists and they think they're the only ones here. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a lot of people in this world think they're the only ones that deserve to go to heaven. Yeah. Let me tell you something. And he told those Pharisees and scribes that day. He said, no. He said, you got this messed up. He said, and they shall come. In Luke chapter 13. He said, and they shall come from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south and shall sit down in the kingdom of God. God says, I'm going to bring them from all in. He told the nation of Israel, I'm going to bring in all my people and gather them back in. And he did that. He's brought in Jews from all four corners of the world. Can I tell you something? Thank God that's what the bride of Christ is going to be. Amen. The bride of Christ is going to be made up of people from all four corners of the earth. It don't matter where you're from. 
You can be saved by the grace of God if you will accept what it finished work by faith. Right. But it's up to us. Right. It's up to us. God's done what He said He was going to do. God did all He needed to do. But it's up to us now. It's up to us. God deals. That Holy Spirit of God comes in and convicts us of our sins. Let's us see our need for a Savior. And then it's up to us as to whether or not we accept Him or whether we're going to reject Him. And He said, I'll bring them in from the north, the south, and the east, and the west. Jesus said, I'll bring them in and they'll sit down in the kingdom of God. Let me tell you something. These, some of these religious people, some of this religious crowd, I'm going to tell you, if they've left out Jesus, I don't care how religious they are. You say what you want to say. I, I'm not going to... Well, I could get into a lot of things right now, but I ain't going to. We see these... You know, take this the wrong way. A Jew, a Christian, and a Muslim got no business holding hands and joining together in fellowship. Right. Mm -hmm. right. I heard a message from Richard Harper. Lord willing, I'm going to see if I can get him down here some kind of short time. But he said he walked into a home in Japan and said he knew they were saved. But he said he looked and he said it was a sculpture of Buddha. And he said he picked it up and he told him, he said, do you not know what this is? He got on in a little deeper, and I'm going to, because he said he looked at the bottom, and he said it had a sticker on it that said made in China. He said, why would anybody want to worship something made in China? But he said, that what they need to realize is, that statue of Buddha is an idol. Right. Right. A Christian got no business with one of them in their house. Right. Right. None. You ain't got any business <laughs> with some of them. I, look, I... God bless him. I hope the Pope's saved. Because yeah. <clears throat> the ain't he's going to hell. I don't care how pretty his hat is and his Pope mobile and his robe. Right. Right. But you yeah. got no business having them icons in your house right. where you're going to walk by and bow to them. Yeah, right. And this right here, you read the book of Jeremiah and you're going to realize that sign of the cross predates Christ by 700 years. Yeah. yeah. Right. That sign of the cross was developed. Read about Nimrod. Where is it? Is it chapter, chapter 6, 7, 8 in the book of Genesis? Yeah. Yeah. The son of Nimrod was Tammuz. And that started with Tammuz. And I ain't getting all into that. Right. But I ain't making no sign of the cross. I ain't bowing at no icon. I ain't bowing at no... Listen to me. If you've got a cross which still shows Jesus on it, it's no longer a cross, it's a crucifix. And you need to understand, yes, we need to be reminded that He went to that cross, but He ain't on it no more. That's right. 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 There's nothing wrong with having a cross, but it's empty. Thank right. God sows the tomb. Right. Don't you be bowing down to something else. Don't hold hands with something else. We're not... Join them together. Thank God He is my God. Beside Him there is no other. <laughs> They'll sit down in the kingdom of God. They'll come from all four corners of the earth. But they will not come from all religions. Only those that are sitting in the kingdom of God are those blood-bought saints who have put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now let's move to verse 7. And I'm going to quit. And everyone, even everyone that is called by my name, for I have created him for my glory. I have formed him. Yea, I have made him. You say, I've, I've made him. I've created him. I've formed him. When you go look at those, those words literally mean God has molded us. And to mold us, there has to be a mold. The word Christian means Christ-like or little Christian. 
I should be molded after Him. And when you go back to this, when He begins to talk about that creation and it being formed, you've got to go back to Jeremiah chapter 18 where He went down to the potter's house and it was, the vessel was actually marred in His hand. Now think on that. That preached for a while. It does not say that the potter marred the vessel. It was marred in his hand. If you're saved by the grace of God, you're in his hand. But when we go out of his will, we are marred. He has to clean us up. And thank God. That's why 1 John's still in the book when it says we'll confess our sin, he's faithful and just forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Mm -hmm. But he said, I have created him for my glory. I have formed him. Yea, I have made him. What does he say? He has put us together. He has made us. Listen to me. We're redeemed. He called us out. And you said, preacher, is that in the right order? Sure it was. Jesus Christ died for us before the Spirit of God ever convicted us of our sins and called us out of a life of sin. Yeah. Right. And once we're saved by the grace of God, God begins to work. That song you used to sing back in the... And I ain't so sure whether... You know, the, but the words make sense. He's still working on me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm not going to be perfect till I get home. But thank God I will be then. I'm not now. I'm a long way from it and I understand that. I've failed in so many ways in my life since I've been saved. If y'all was honest, some of y'all would say the same thing. But He has created us. He has formed us. He has molded us. He has made us into what we are. And in Ephesians chapter 2, He tells us and makes it very plain. I am not saved by my works. I am saved by God's grace and my faith. But after we're saved, for we are His workmanship. When I am saved, got saved by the grace of God, it wasn't up to me to mold myself. It wasn't up to you to mold yourself. It wasn't up to you to go in and form yourself. It's up to God to go in. And sometimes when we're first saved, think about that potter with the clay on the wheel to get that figure just like he wants it or whatever he's making. He has to put a little pressure. He has to squeeze. And sometimes it's not real comfortable when God is making us into what he wants us to be. That's right. But we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Remember, I'm bought with a price. I'm not my own. Let's circle it back. And we're going to finish up right here. Created under good works in Christ Jesus, or in Christ Jesus, under good works. Now, listen to me. We ain't got any business doing what we can do so somebody can walk up and say, yeah. no, yep. sir. No, sir, because Jesus tells us very plainly that if we do what we do down here just to be seen of men, we have our rewards. So don't expect That's the Father right. to say a word. Yep. Don't expect a reward. Don't expect a crown. Don't expect an attaboy. Listen to me. What we do, we do for Him. And I'm jumping ahead because I'll get to that in just a minute. He says, created in Christ Jesus under good works, which God had before ordained that we should walk in them. So what did He do? He said, I have created Him for my glory. When I walk in works for Him, then I give Him glory. When I do the things He wants me to do, then He gets glory. We're not here. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6. Let your light shine so that they may see your good works and glorify who? Not me, but my Father which is in heaven. Right. <clears throat> so He said we are created in the good works which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. And that's why He tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 is that it says whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Right. God's glory. God's glory. These things I've done that I know my wife at times to begin with, she shook her head. My youngins have shook their head. And like, what is he? But they trusted me. They trusted me. 
We do what we do because we feel like God's leading. And whatever work we do, whether it's teaching a Sunday school class, whether it's singing, whether it's picking up cigarette butts and trash out in the parking lot, they ain't no glory. Listen to me. Let's put it blunt. And I'm gonna I'm gonna single her out and she gets upset. I'm sorry, Miss Dorsey. There ain't no glory in scrubbing toilets. Come on, ladies. Y'all done it for years. Glory to God, I get to get up this morning and scrub two bathroom toilets and clean them nasty tubs. Ain't none of y'all ever done that. Mm -hmm. Yet, after every service, toilets get clean, floors get clean, things get done. I don't see her doing it. You don't see her doing it. Like I said, I'm just going to pick on her. If it bothers her, no, I'm sorry. I ain't looking at her while I'm saying it, but I'm talking about her. <coughs> but my point is what we do we don't do to be seen of men yeah. we do for God's honor and God's That's right. right. whatsoever you do because God says I have created you for my glory and I've formed you I've made you I've made you to do what I tell you to do I'm done right now y'all know this verse as good as I do listen to me he redeemed us Jesus paid the price <coughs> He called us out of a life of sin, a life of wickedness, a life of evil. You say, preacher, I was a good old boy. I don't keep you as a good old boy. In God's eyes, you're still full of sin and headed to hell. That's right. But He called us out. And then, He created us. He made us into what He wants us to be. Whether we do it, it's up to us. But we're to do what He tells us. Because that's why we can say in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. God says, I've formed you into something that you ain't never been before. Amen. And I've had people tell me, preacher, I'm afraid that if I got saved, I couldn't live. Don't worry about living. That's why he sends you the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. You will become something you've never been before. You will walk a road you've never walked before. You will do things you never did before. You might even say things you've never said before. And the things that you used to say, you won't say. The places you used to go, you won't go. The things you used to do, you won't do. Because now that we're saved, God's called us out. He's paid the price. He's called us from out of the world. He's brought us into His family. Now He has created us. He has molded us. He has formed us. He has made us. And thank God we all be new creatures and say, thank you, Lord, for letting me do what you want me to do. Amen. All right. But this morning, if you've never been saved, you're still out in the north, south, east, and west. You're still separated from the family of God. Now understand, He has already redeemed you. Now you understand that? Jesus has already paid the price. If, you, if, you're, if you're under the sound of my voice this morning and you've never been saved, Jesus Christ has already paid the price for your sins. Mm -hmm. He died on that cross at Calvary and shed enough blood for every sin that every man, woman, boy, girl had ever made. But what did you do? Did you accept it or did you reject it? Did you say, I want it or did you refuse it? What did you do with it? you've never been saved, you're still out in the four corners. You are separated from God. And if you die like it, you'll be separated throughout eternity. You say, well, preacher, I'm going to turn over a new leaf. Let me just throw this. And I've said it before, but it bears repeating. Can I tell you one quick reason why Adam and Eve's leaves wouldn't work in the Garden of Eden? I know there wasn't any blood. But it didn't matter which side they turned those leaves over. They are still sinners in God's eyes. Mm -hmm. And y'all to look this time of year and realize that when we try to cover up, they tried to cover up with leaves. Look this time of year, what's happening to the leaves? They're drying, they're getting crumbly, and they'll fall apart. Anything I try to do in myself is going to fall apart. It's not about turning over a new leaf. Thank God it's about looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Because the blood 
will never lose its power. So this morning, what have you done? He's already redeemed you. He's already paid the price. He's already shed the blood. He's already paid your ransom. But the one who paid that ransom, the one who came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, one of these days he's coming back. As I said a while ago, every knee's going to bow. Right. At that point, oh yes, you will confess him as for who he really is. You say, preacher, I ain't bowing my knee. You will. Yeah. You will. Word. And you'll be begging for the rocks and the mountains to fall on you and hide you from the face of him that sitteth upon the throne. He's already redeemed you. He's called you out. But did you come? If you've never been saved, you never came. And if you don't come, he can't make you into what he wants you to be. And you're never going to be what God wants you to be without being saved. Oh, you you can sit on a you can sit on a church pew till till you know what? They want nobody else fit in that nick you're gonna make. You can put enough money in the offering plate that people will think you the best supporter the church has ever had. You can do whatever needs to be done around here. And people will say, well, you know what? They're bound to be saved. But you're not going to be what you need to be. You're not going to be what God commands you to be until you accept Jesus Christ right. as Lord and Savior. So this morning, what's it going to be? What's it going to be? The Bible still says that thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. Believe in thy heart God has raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. For with a heart, man believeth unto righteousness with a mouth. Confession is made unto salvation. Believe in that heart, not that head. That heart. And then confess him before me. You say, well, preacher, I've asked Jesus into my heart, but I've never said anything out loud. Well, my Bible still says, Jesus said, if we're ashamed to confess him in this sinful and adulterous generation, he'll be ashamed to confess us before his Father, which is in heaven. Do you want that? Do you want that? Old Nicodemus came by night and Joseph and Arimathea were secret disciples. But when it came down to it, they went to Pilate and begged the body of Jesus. They stood up and admitted who they were, admitted what they were, and were not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. This morning, he's called you out. What are you going to do? Father, we thank you for the day. We thank you for taking care of us and watching over us. We thank you for allowing us to be back in your house this morning. We thank you for each one of these that's come out. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to look at a portion of your word. And I pray, God, this morning I said what you had me to say and pray that I said it in the right way. So, Father, I beg you now to take the message and use it. Father, there might be one that's here, might be one watching and listening that don't know Jesus, I beg you, God, tell them the price has done been paid. Tell them. Let them realize redemption has already been paid. The ransom's already been paid. That you just need to you're there to call them out and they just need to follow you. God, I beg you this morning, touch heart. Help us to realize, God, we'll never be what you'd have us to be until we're saved by your wonderful grace. Father, you have your way in this invitation for what you do. We'll thank you. We'll praise you. We'll give you the honor and the glory for we ask it in Jesus' holy name. Amen.